Good evening, everyone. Glad you are here with us tonight. We are into part 13. Now, as we start off tonight, I wanted to give you an update. You may remember, and if you saw the uh, message, uh, or the reminder message from uh, Westminster, um, that this was to be our penultimate meeting, and we were going to have one more meeting. But when I started working on it, it really didn't have enough information without belaboring the point. And I, I think you know I've tried to not get too deep into the weeds. Some of you may feel like I have anyway, but I've tried to keep it um, at the survey level, so to speak. We've gone a little deeper than our survey class. Um, but so as I did that, what I was going to do next week was sort of a, what does it all mean? And that would have been really fun had we been in person because you could have asked questions. And again, that's one of the things that I miss the most about doing it this way is it's, there's no real easy way for you to ask questions. Those of you who are at the keyboard, you certainly can use the Zoom chat and type me a question. In fact, um, I'd love it if you did that. Those of you who are in um, the main center there at Stover, you obviously, if you can get Becca to type one in, you can type one in from there or whoever's helping uh, tonight. But you can always, always email me, but it's not the immediate like we like to do. So because there's not enough material for what I had thought would be the last, the next to last session, we're gonna combine the two. And then next week, we're gonna take a break. It's probably good for me um, to take a break, to give my brain a fresh uh, refresher before we slide into where we'll be the subsequent week. Um, so on the 17th, and we will be starting, as I already told you, kind of a look at social and cultural history in the latter 19th century uh, into the early 20th century. So we will end up with um, the progressives, um, Presidents Roosevelt and Wilson. We, we, won't, we won't talk a lot about them as presidents. We'll be looking at the progressive movement. But you'll see at the end of the session tonight, we're all kind of leading there. So it kind of dovetails in but we're not gonna be talking about political history, really. Um, it's certainly not any kind of military, imperialism, none of that, we're not gonna look at World War I, or we're not gonna look at Spanish-American War. So we're gonna kind of dovetail together. So it, it'll do me good to have a break. I love you guys, and it means so much to me that you enjoy coming, and I'm looking forward to continuing uh, Valencia at Westminster. And uh, maybe sometime in 2021, we'll get back to face-to-face, -to -face, but this has been a good, um, a good uh, way of trying to, to get there. So tonight we're going to wrap up the Civil War and then I'm going to do a little bit at the end that kind of talks about wh wh what does it all mean for us. And of course I'm not in any way given the summation, I'm just one observer like yourselves kind of looking. In that vein, back to the questions by the way, and we'll get there it's about 20 minutes to go or so I think, in that vein, as we're going, or even as you're thinking there right now, if over the total of the 13 sessions, you've had questions about the Civil War that we've not addressed, or you've had some thoughts about it, you will, and you'd like my take on a question, please use the Zoom chat. You can type it in now, and I'll answer when we get there if I don't cover it in other ways. It's okay if you don't, but we're going to try to cover as much ground as possible. So thanks for joining us. This is our last session on the Civil War, and then we'll take a break next week. Uh, where we left off, things were bleak, and really, we've already acknowledged the war was over. You just had to convince the Confederacy. One of the points we noticed last week was even as Lincoln offered his lenient reconstruction program, even as the armies were marching through the various parts of the South, most Union soldiers and officers were surprised at how defiant Southerners were, which again gets into how the war shifts. And it's, it's interesting, I thought about this, you know, if we say Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and maybe the Gettysburg Address along with it, shifted the, the storyline from being just about can, uh, preserving the Union to doing this social good thing of ending slavery. So the, the purpose of the war shifts, right? It, I think you could say it shifts in the South as well, because for most Southerners, we saw this when we looked way back in the beginning of the sessions, you know, most Southerners do not own any slaves. Um, they, they, in fact, they would admit that there was something of a rich man's war um, compared that, you know, the planter class in the South had fought and for them, and certainly we saw in the CSA Constitution, slavery was absolutely 
front and center. But the average Southerner, slavery was not their big thing, but they were interested in preserving what they perceived to be um, an attack against what they thought the Constitution meant, the Constitution of Jefferson and Madison and Monroe. And we talked all about that. But as the war went on, even with Lincoln's leniency, aspects of the war for the average person began to be, you know, you're down here, you're invading my home. And we saw in that very wonderful and chilling and, and you know, helpful exchange, helpful to you and me, between um, Generals um, Sherman and Hood at the time of Atlanta, and just Hood's defiance about what was going on. And you just kind of want to go to him and say, really? That, that, you know, but he couldn't see it. So all that to say, even as, you know, you roll through the election, you would have thought after the election, Southerners kind of in mass would have said, okay, well, that's it. And they didn't. And even as there was this, you know, crushing defeat after crushing defeat, and that last defeat we saw outside of Nashville, where um, the army just melts away. It's the first time in, the, in either army's story where the losing army of a battle just really just disappeared. And so 40,000, 30,000 some odd men just vanish. And so even in that moment, if you'd gone around and found various Southern communities, they would have still thought the war was winnable. And regardless of what the armies were doing, they were not going to change. Now that obviously speaks volumes to what's going to happen after the war and reconstruction, right? So when we left off, Sherman was in Savannah. He had had that really wonderful moment that's a part of the early reconstruction when he offers the 40 acres of land to any slave family. I think it was a family. It could have been also an individual, uh, probably an individual male who wanted it, as well as any mule or horse or donkey that was that they were willing to get rid of. 40 acres and a mule. And so really from um, most of South Carolina all the way down through Georgia and all the way into northern Florida, land was broken up. And for the next probably eight to 10 months, there will be land given to slaves in those islands, sea islands and coastal lands that are there. And, and that'll be what will seem to be a good start for reconstruction. We noted we didn't have any word from Lincoln what he thought. So it, it's kind of tough to say. But now Sherman's gonna march north. And rolling into South Carolina, you know, it's interesting, again, Gone with the Wind kind of puts the focus of Sherman's march through Georgia. And certainly it's a famous march to the sea. It is a very famous march to the sea. And so it deserves its place, right, in, in both military terms and in social history terms. But what Sherman and his troops did to Georgia pales in comparison to what they did to South Carolina. Just nobody ever talks about it. And, and one of the ways that I like to express it to students is, of course, usually we're teaching this Civil War at the end of our Marian History I class. So we've had 15 weeks together of, you know, early colonization, exploration, colonization, formation of the country, and then the, you know, the years from 17, you know, 87 uh, with the Constitution to, to now. And throughout that time, and you may have noticed it in our first four or five sessions, we did kind of the overview leading into the war, South Carolina is front and center. From the moment Sherman rolls into South Carolina, arguably to this day, no offense to anybody who lives in South Carolina, but South Carolina vanishes from importance. It was arguably one of the most important states um, the Revolutionary War turns in South Carolina. They don't get their due. Um, the men who fought uh, Cornwallis there really were more important to winning the war than most of what Washington's army did. Um, we talked about John C. Calhoun. There's just so many important leaders and so many important moments in the uh, history story up to the Civil War that involved South Carolina. And then after Sherman, you don't hear about South Carolina. Um, they're the, one of the states, early states, I guess, that maybe votes. You know, we talk about South Carolina as the first, usually the first Southern state and the president. Um, they're not there. That's because of what Sherman does. The governor knew it. And so he begs Lee, hey, come help me. Of course, Lee's trapped in Richmond. And he, of course, says there's that sentence you can see for yourself. <laughs> what, what do you want? The, does the governor want both Sherman and Grant's armies in South Carolina? I can't come. And so there was no army there um, at, at all. 
you know, in the story. February 15th, they approached the capital. Now, Columbia was a very important um, state or city for the Confederacy. And to some degree, when you look at political and governing, it was probably the second city. Now, Atlanta and New Orleans were obviously more important in the overall scope of the, of the nation, of the, of the Confederacy. But Columbia was kind of the second city. And in the East, it certainly was the second city. Major rail hub, major production center, major distribution center, um, a factory place for clothing, blankets, cloth. Um, and so Sherman's rolling into it. And as he gets closer, there's literally no army of any significance to stop him. If you go back to this map here, I mean, there, you see the red lines representing the Confederate forces. They're really just, just not even anything Sherman's worried about. Um, there's just no way to build an army with what's left of the Confederacy, particularly in South Carolina at this point, to do anything to help them. So Sherman just rolling forward, there's a few little clashes here and there, nothing of significance. Fires are started. Now, this gets us back to what happened with Atlanta. Atlanta and Columbia have very similar stories um, in that they both get burned. And in both cases, it's easy to accuse Sherman and the army, you burned the city. The evidence is more mixed. And in both cases, the people who live there and or the Confederate soldiers who were leaving will, um, will set fire to either factories or materials. Remember in Atlanta, they blew up um, ammunition railroads. Sherman's army didn't need the ammunition, but they blew it up anyway. And that sort of massive fires in Atlanta. Well, here they start burning um, cotton. And of course, you know cotton, or I'm sure you've seen cotton. And as much like leaves will, can catch on fire and then float in the wind, cotton and cotton factories can also. And so as the mayor comes to, this, comes to Sherman to surrender, he's not like the mayor of Savannah, who's offering a basically safe city that's not been harmed. His city's already on fire. Now, there's, there's, there's some evidence that Sherman said to put the fires out, but there's also clear evidence that they didn't try hard. And there's some also evidence that there were some soldiers who contributed. Perhaps worse, some of the civilians thought if they offered the soldiers a gift of alcohol, that would help. And I'm sure all of you know that more alcohol never helps. And so now you have soldiers who approach South Carolina with the most anger that they have. Um, there was no animosity per se against Atlanta and certainly not against Savannah. But with Columbia and South Carolina, there was a, a bent, there was an energy, there was an intentionality. We will destroy as much as we can, as wide as we can. And so now you've, you've gotten a bunch of those young people drunk who hate you already. So it completely backfired. And there were numerous stories of soldiers attacking civilians, attacking homes, setting some fires. Again, who started the fire? Well, started by the people who lived there in the Confederacy. But, but if, if Atlanta's more of a mystery, Columbia is not. Sherman and the, and the men wanted Columbia to suffer, and it did. So over one third of the city is destroyed. And from there, they're just going to march on north into North Carolina. And you can see, of course, Sherman's response when the next couple of days, civilians were like, you know, help us or do something. And Sherman's like, mm, no, sorry, not doing it. And, and this is really critical because if you think, if you think in terms of, well, these were American citizens who had been betrayed or misled, then you're missing the energy that I've tried to show you of the Confederacy. At no point does the Confederacy think of itself as anything other than an independent nation. In fact, we'll get to Jefferson Davis in a minute. And when he's under arrest after the war is over, he never goes on trial. But when he's under arrest, his whole argument was, you cannot put me on trial for treason because I was the leader of another country. Now, that would have been interesting to see how that worked out. So Sherman's like, I don't owe you anything. You guys brought this on yourselves. Remember what he told the folks at Atlanta? You stop the war? I'll defend you. 
you say you're wrong and you're sorry and you want to come back, I'll defend you. And this is where the real rub of reconstruction, which again, we're not going to go de deep in reconstruction, becomes where you have the real Republicans, the abolitionists, and men like Sherman, who wasn't really an abolitionist, but who had suffered through the war, who were tired of seeing his country attacked, and they're not, they're angry. They're angry and they want to punish these traitors. These people committed treason. And at the same time, you've got these Southerners who are not apologetic. They're not, they're not confessing their sins. They're not on their hands and knees begging. They are defiant. Um, well, I won't tell you this part when we get there, but when Lincoln's assassinated, all throughout the South, as word went through, there's diaries of just hundreds of hundreds of people who are so happy. They're really happy. In fact, there's a few who think that might change the outcome. And so, you know, there's not a sense of, oh, they're really sad and we should be nice to them. These are traitors and they've committed treason. So they march all the way through South Carolina into North Carolina. North Carolina does not suffer the way South Carolina does, um, but the destruction there is pretty strong. Now, after he's rolling through Columbia is the inauguration. So now this is the first president to win a second election since Jackson. So over 30 years, it's pretty impressive. Grant will follow him and win two terms. And between Andrew Jackson and Woodrow Wilson, they're the only two men to win two terms. Well, McKinley does as well. And like Lincoln, he's also assassinated. So um, Grant's the only one to serve two terms. The day's made a holiday. It's really overcast. And many people noted that it remained overcast until Lincoln got up to speak. And his second inaugural is right up there with the Gettysburg Address as one of the best speeches by certainly an American politician. And it's, again, Lincoln trying to cast a frame or vision around the war. He's trying to set the tone of what he hopes will happen as we go forward. So he's thinking through his next four years. And right out of the gate, he starts talking about this was war was about slavery. So again, we come back to this issue of slavery and the confusion by many people when you try to figure out what's the Civil War about. Um, and, and ultimately, slavery is at the centerpiece of it. Now, Lincoln is deflective and broad, like I would say also. So you can see, as he's kind of stating there, you know, to strengthen and perpetuate and extend the interest of slavery was the object. And we, we all knew that this interest somehow was the cause of the war. When he starts speaking, the sun comes out. Everybody there noted. It was like, wow, it's really kind of cool. And then he shifts it and talks about God. And he talked about the fact that, and you can see the whole thing. I'm going to read this big section to you. He says, you know, both sides read the same Bible and they pray to the same God. And each side invokes God's aid. But the prayers of both could not be answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. And then he gets into this issue of slavery, which one of the most important lines that I think is, is in here. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, so it's an offense, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove slavery, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from these divine attributes, which the believers in the living God always ascribe to him. In other words, if God, if we're going to say God allowed slavery, okay, fine. Now God is saying slavery, it's going to be over. And the way I'm going to get it over and punish you for contributing for this slavery for these 250 years is through this war, right? You, then you have to say it's God's will. And he goes on and says that we could wish that God would take the scourge of war away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so it still must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It's a very powerful moment in which he is affirming what all the founders and all the 
Political leaders, at least through the 19th century, would have believed, we've seen, I think we've lost this maybe in the 20th century, and that is that God has his wills. We can say we are a Christian nation to some degree, or God's hand has been with the nation, um, but God's ways, we have to walk through those ways that he wills it, including punishment for slavery. Then he comes to the to powerful end, which many people know of his second inaugural, and it kind of wraps up again his view of reconstruction with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we're in. What is that work? To bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It is a very liberal approach, lenient and kind and giving to the nation. And again, as you may remember, he's even talking to Republicans who don't like him. So it's funny how we, in the moment when a person is the president, we draw certain conclusions. The light of history, not always, but sometimes presents a very different picture. Lincoln was not an extraordinarily popular president. Remember, he was elected with less than 40% of the vote. Um, and he became more unpopular as he went along. And yet he held firm in his beliefs. And now here he's offering this vision of a, you know, a warm and just future. So as he's doing this, he's saying all this knowing that the 13th Amendment had been finally passed by both houses of Congress. Now, it had actually been passed by the Senate in 64. So again, remember one of the things we said about the Emancipation Proclamation is that it didn't free any slaves, but it did propel forward those proponents of abolition and would lead them into the fight in Congress. And they had successfully gotten um, the amendment passed through the Senate. Well, with the election of 64, when the new Congress would have taken office, and they don't usually would have, in that time, wouldn't even really come to the, to the D.C. until at least the spring, if not the early summer of 65, the Republicans had a, a, a super majority, so to speak. So Lincoln wants to get this passed before then. So he pushes and prods, and if you saw the movie Lincoln, it does a very good job. It's based on Doris Goodwin's book, and she does, she's a wonderful historian. It's very solidly researched. It's a, really one of the movies, historical Hollywood movies, that's actually very close to the historical story, um, and showing how he's prodding and pushing to get it passed with the old Congress, in which the Republicans have a majority, but not a supermajority. And it needed to be passed by two-thirds. It is passed by two-thirds. And from that point forward, it goes to be ratified. It will be ratified um, before the end of the year. Interestingly, um, they get the three-fourths with some northern states rejecting it. So New Jersey, Kentucky, Delaware, these are states in the union who reject the amendment and uh, will pass it later, some of them much later. Um, even into the 20th century. Of course, once it's three-fourths, you don't have to pass it, uh, but some of them decided they didn't want to pass it uh, in the process. So it is passed, and it's enough to be ratified as they go through the process. By the end of the year, they get it fully ratified. But this is obviously a major moment. We talk about, like, well, what's the point of the Civil War? You know, this is one of the points. This is one of the huge takeaways, that slavery is officially eliminated Three-fifths clause, the Fugitive Slave Act, they're all kind of eliminated with the 13th Amendment. Is it a perfect amendment? No. And if you study Reconstruction, and we'll see when we look at civil rights in, the, in our next you know, session, our next the series that we do, um, the 13th Amendment will be twisted um, by people in the South to, to some degree, extend a version of slavery, which is you know, disappointing. But, so this takes us to Richmond, so we have to wrap the war up. Through the winter, Grant has gotten more and more and more and more troops. Um, March the 2nd, while Sherman's kind of making his way through South Carolina, Grant's number two with his army, Phil Sheridan, destroys utterly the last, you know, little army uh, outside of the Shenandoah um, Valley. And um, 
the next day, Lee, knowing this, actually writes to Grant saying, hey, well, what are the, what are your ideas for peace? And this is interesting because what Lee's talking about is maybe a larger national peace. Grant recognizes this may be out of my, out of my league. He sends it to Lincoln and Lincoln writes back, as you can see there, very clear instructions that Grant could only talk about the surrender of Lee's army and all political questions were to be left with Lincoln. And so Grant's like, okay, that's good. That's good for me. So he lets Lee know that and Lee kind of, okay. And Lee and Longstreet are constantly kind of trying to figure out what should we do? Remember Longstreet and Grant are really close friends. And so, you know, in the process of that, um, you know, Longstreet's trying to help Lee figure out like what they can do. As you can see, they're really outnumbered. I mean, four to one odds. I mean, if Grant wanted to just make it a bloodbath, he could have, he could attack. Um, and there would be no way of kind of doing it. He doesn't want to do that. So what he's just doing is he's continuing to stretch the line. The longer he stretches the fortifications on the outside of Petersburg, the worse it is for Lee. And so eventually he gets him so stretched that he's able to send Sheridan, who's now with Grant out of the Shenandoah Valley, around the far right flank. So kind of on this map, kind of all the way around over here. Lee had tried to, you know, kind of, uh, fake Grant out with a, an attack on the 25th. It really went nowhere. It, it, there's, there's no possibility of the Confederacy defeating the Union. They're, they're, the Army's really starved at this point. Um, Sheridan sends Grant a message like, I can make it. I can do it. And Lee's like, I mean, Grant's like, do it. You get around him. I feel like ending this thing. Let's go. And so he sends him around the rear of, of Lee. And so this up here, so here on this map is different. Right there, here's Petersburg up here, and this begins showing you the direction of where they're going to go. So there's the, the fortifications here on this line here. And so Sheridan's down here, and he's going to try to race over to this side to kind of beat them to this part called Five Forks. So what they're doing is they're trying to make sure that they don't give Lee a way to head south into the Carolinas to meet up with the other army that's there, con not confronting, but that is between them and Sherman. So Sherman's marching north, although at this point he's kind of hanging out near, near Raleigh. He's not really sure, you know, kind of just sort of wait to see what happens. And Sheridan's got him trapped. You can see there's a battle where, you know, we lose 600 casualties, the Confederacy over 5,000. He alerts Davis, we have to leave. We have to withdraw now because if he doesn't withdraw, then Sheridan will be able to get all the way around. And once he's all the way around, sorry, once he's all the way around up here, now that's a complete, you know, sack. They've trapped them. Davis is at church. This is a Sunday. And he gets this note, and, he, and people watching him said he turned ashen white. He gets up immediately and heads out. The service just ends. People start pouring out. And all of a sudden, rapidly through the town, people start telling each other, Davis is leaving, the army's leaving, Lee is leaving. And this panic begins to go as they know it's, it's over at this point. On the second, Grant launches this attack, like we talked about, all across the line, pressing, knowing that there's no way Lee can, can withstand it. Lee's pulling people out in a desperate race. So all these on this map here, you can see the big map over here, this, this longer one, all these spots along the Appomattox River are locations where Lee is trying to get to a railroad crossing or a series of roads that he could use to go south. And in every spot, the Union is in front of him. April the 3rd, Richmond is occupied. So finally, after those four long years, back when Bull Run began in, in the summer of 61, you know, on to Richmond, they finally occupy Richmond. Lincoln comes the next day by boat um, and will be greeted by thousands of African Americans on the, on the coast, on the, on the sh not the shore, uh, but where the, the port is that he, he, he goes off. Um, he's obviously guarded. Um, most of the citizens of the city, white citizens, stayed indoors. He actually goes to Jefferson Davis's office, sits in his chair, uh, has a very thoughtful moment, doesn't really say much, but is kind of contemplative, thinking of Jefferson Davis being in that chair, you know, just the 48 hours before. On the 4th, they reach uh, this spot here where they think they can get out Amelia Courthouse 
and they find that Sheridan is already ahead of them. And of course, then they keep moving. And as they get there to here, Sailor's Creek, there's another clash in which um, Sheridan is able to capture thousands of troops, capture some of their last supplies. And he wires Grant famously, I think if the thing is pressed, Lee will surrender. And so Grant knows. So Grant actually gets on a horse and has a borrowed uniform, basically, and rides with some, you know, his, his guard to catch up to Sheridan because he wants to be there to kind of lead. He puts two of his, um, of his main units that are with Sheridan into force march so that there's more than just Sheridan's cavalry that are there, and they're racing to get around. And really the last possible place before you can see Lynchburg over here is Appomattox Station. If they can get to Appomattox, there's a railroad, doesn't go south, but it would get Lee and some of the soldiers away. And so they're racing to get there. They won't get there. By this point, Lee's army has dwindled to maybe 15,000 troops who are fit for duty. And so Grant writes to Lee, and he goes, look, the results of last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance. He kind of goes on and throws Lee, not under the bus, but he's like, hey, look, if there's further bloodshed, it's on you. It's not on me. I'm telling you, you know you've lost. You fought valiantly. Time to bring it in. He doesn't agree, and so he rejects the offer, but he does write back and say, you know, what, what will your terms be? And Grant, Mr. Unconditional Surrender, is now a very different man from having hung out with Lincoln. And he just says, you know, I really all I want is the men to lay down their arms, and they go home. That's a very different story than he gave back at the forts in Tennessee, remember? It was much more strict, and he's, he's seen the, the, the devastation of the war, and he agrees with Lincoln. Lincoln very much believes, look, these guys just all want to go home. If we just let them go home, they'll go home. They'll never fight us ever again. So Palm Sunday, April 9th, um, Lee figures out Sher Sheridan is there. So he, he writes, he says to an, an aide there, there's nothing left for me to do but go see General Grant. And they poignantly added, I, I would rather die a thousand deaths. You know, I just don't want to do it but he knows he has to. So thus begins the exchange of notes for a ceasefire. They begin to locate a place and they find the house of a man named Wilbur McLean. Now the interesting thing is McLean was someone who had owned a farm near Manassas. And during the first battle, his house was damaged and was used also as a hospital. So you know how gross, gruesome that would be. So after the battle, he and his wife were like, yeah, we're out of here. We don't want to be in the middle of this. Um, so they sold their farm near Manassas, and they moved to what they perceived would be this remote part of Virginia where no war would come to them. And, of course, now the conclusion of the war comes to them. If you put this in a movie, nobody believes it, right? A guy at the first day. In fact, when the, the battle was, the days before the battle was going to happen, McLean was one of several locals who gave some tours of the area two Confederate officers try to help them understand the lay of the land. So here's McLean, day one or battle one, and now here is the very end. Lee arrived in his best uniform. What Lee assumed, and this is again one of the issues throughout the South um, that I think where Lincoln makes this mistake about his leniency, Lee assumes that there will be a punitive response. And he says, you know, when he was asked by one of his guys, why are you dressing up? Well, I probably have to be General Grant's prisoner and thought it best to make my best appearance. Okay. Now, Grant has been riding for three days in the same uniform, and he doesn't even change. In fact, Grant wrote in his, in his, uh, in his you know, here's his memoirs. I highly recommend it to you. Grant writes, you know, that he had a, a splitting migraine until he gets Lee's note saying, hey, come meet me here. So they get a place to meet. Now his migraine goes away. He rides up. And then you can see up one of uh, Grant's own officers said, Grant, he was covered with mud in an old faded uniform. It wasn't even his uniform. Um, looked like a fly on a shoulder of beef. So, you know, here's Lee in his finest outfit. Grant's muddy, you know, kind of just got whatever. Kind of does reflect the two men. When they, when they arrived, Grant was so consumed to some degree with protecting Lee's feelings. They kind of chat amicably. Lee's about, I think, 12 or 15 years Grant senior. 
Um, so Grant remembers Lee, Lee doesn't remember Grant, kind of talking. And finally Lee's like, well, we, we need to get down to the reason we're here. And Grant's like, oh, right, 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 right. And he's like, well, what are your terms? And Grant's like, same thing I told you before. I want everybody to lay down their arms and never, you know, they'll all be paroled. They won't go to prison camp. Um, and, you know, until such time as the, you know, the politicians finalize things, they can't take up arms against us again. Um, and, you know, if they've got a, a officers have a horse, they keep it. Lee's stunned that that's it. Um, no mention of him being held captive. I mean, just so you understand, Lee knows he's committed treason. Lee knows that Grant could, if he wanted to, call for a tribunal right there and have him executed on the spot, or at least within a day. So Grant not doing that, particularly with his reputation, you know, he's a butcher, he's a bloodbath, you know, unconditional surrender, Grant, um, Lee is taken aback. And, and he says to Grant, I, I think, wow, this will, this will have the most generous uh, feeling to the men. It, it didn't, but that's what Lee thought. And in fact, Lee later, he says, Grant, write this stuff down. So Grant writes it all down, very specific. You can see things listed there. And then later, um, Lee says, well, what about, you know, some of the men, and like particularly in the artillery, they actually have some of their own horses also. And that's not in the, the documents. And Grant's like, yeah, it's not in the documents. And he, he didn't change it. But he did instruct his own officers when they took the materials, the, all the goods and the firearms from the Confederates, when they did the official surrender in a few more days, that if someone claimed that that was their horse, they could have their horse or their sidearm. And again, you're looking at this kind of difference. In one sense, I think I, most of us probably appreciate the, mag, the magnanimous feelings and attitude that Grant is taking. Like you want that, right? You want to be kind and generous. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have the effect that, that everybody wished for when you look at Reconstruction. I um, mean, they, as they leave, Grant's like, do you need anything else? And Lee's like, uh, we don't have any food. And Grant's like, okay, well, uh, you can have 25,000 rations, which is more than they really needed for the soldiers that they had. And um, so it's an amazing, amazing moment. And of course, you know, when you have these hopes for a reunion of the country, those are generous moments. And the moment when they turn in their weapons has an equally poignant, beautiful moment. Joshua Chamberlain, the hero of Little Round Top, was in charge of the Union side. John B. Gordon, who's one of, you know, Lee's last remaining kind of fighting. He's tough. He's not backing down. He was one of the last ones to fight in the war on the race to Appomattox, is in charge. When they come in, the men are stacking their arms. It's, it's very poignant. Obviously, the Confederate troops are, are bedraggled, and they're frustrated, but they're defiant. And as they march in, Chamberlain orders his troops to the order carry arms, which is a salute for, you know, in marching. Gordon kind of hears them snapping to and looks around and then orders his troops to the same salute, same order, and the Confederates snap to attention and carry their arms like they're supposed to. And then Gordon wheeled around in his horse, does this very famous kind of elaborate cavalry bow with his sword and his hat on his horse. And many men writing in their journals later remembered this moment, thought it was an amazing moment. And so you have this kind of sweet kind of, ah. Oh. And for many people, this is the end of the Civil War. But it is not. There were other armies still outstanding. Joe Johnson, who we've seen from day one, is actually on the same day meeting with Davis, who had escaped from the city and gotten down to North Carolina. And, he, and he's sailed, telling Davis, we're going to have to surrender. Lee's surrender is not the end of the war. Because it's so close to Lincoln's assassination, everybody thinks of it that way. But you can see Johnson's statement there that, you know, our people are tired of war. The country's overrun. We, we, you know, my army is melting away like snow before the sun. And Davis, of course, doesn't know what to do. He, he doesn't have a way to get the Congress together. He doesn't have a way to get his cabinet together. He's really on his own. There's a sense which you should really feel for Davis because he has this weight of leadership. And yet, you, you know, you want somebody, hey, we all got into this together, right? We all had our states vote. Don't just leave me out here by myself to make this decision. And so there's a little poignancy. I always feel for Davis because I don't think he's the evil you know, some people like to blame him the most. Even in the South, he's one of the few people, you won't find too many statues of Jefferson Davis 
um, you know, built in the past 150 years throughout the South. Um, then, of course, this leads us to the, the sad moment just two days later. Now, so this is Holy Week, right? So that was Palm Sunday when this is all going down. So on Monday, Thursday, Grant's in D.C., goes on a tour. Everybody's cheering. Everybody's so excited. Lincoln had tickets to see the play Our American Cousin, in which uh, there was a, a famous actress that everybody wanted to see. And so he asked Grant to come, and Grant said, sure. Um, but Grant's wife, Julia, and Lincoln's wife, Mary, they didn't always get along. And, and Julia's like, you know what? I just want to go see my kids. So she convinces Grant, we're going to get on the train and take off. And so they do. Now, then Lincoln struggles to find somebody, eventually finds um, the daughter of a senator and her fiance, who's a major, uh, to come with them and sit in the presidential box. And this, of course, leads us to John Wilkes Booth. Booth. Um, so Booth was someone, and again, that, that Booth is in D.C., I think is indicative of the kind of close nature of this whole thing working together. Booth was someone who kind of was a closet Confederate. He really wanted to join the Army, but ultimately he was a coward and wouldn't just go join the Army. He was an actor, actually a pretty good actor. Um, Lincoln had seen him, had seen plays that he was in. Uh, and, and Booth, and they had interacted to some degree, and Lincoln, Booth doesn't like him. Uh, Booth's at the second inaugural, and that picture that I showed, there's, you can zoom in really close, and there's a person that everybody's, you know, that's Booth. So he's at, he hears the speech of Lincoln's, you know, magnanimous sense of, you know, hey, justice for everybody, and he's not convinced. He's unhappy. And he had been thinking and contriving with a group of ragtag people, and you see the list of conspirators there, of ways to get to Lincoln, really since late 64. In March of 65, he thought he had heard Lincoln was going to be basically by himself on the road, or maybe with his son, he could kidnap him. He kind of wanted to kidnap him and take him to Richmond and turn him over to Davis. And that had been interesting, just to see that whole thing unfold. I'm not sure what Davis would have done. Um, when that goes south, the three that are there in yellow, um, Surratt, Arnold, and O'Laughlin, they leave. They, they're not, we're not going to participate in this thing. But Booth is still getting stoked up. And so then he knows, because of his friends in the theater, that Lincoln's going to this play. And so on the night of the play, he slips in and he unleashes basically his plan. Now, his plan was not just to kill Lincoln but to try to strike at the whole government. So again, he thought Grant would be there. So he's got a person aimed at Grant, a person aimed at Vice President Johnson, and a person aimed at the Secretary of State. Um, that They're all targeted. They're all supposed to go and attack. Booth is after Lincoln. He knows the play, so he gets to the, to the play, and he stands outside the box for, I think, 30, 45 minutes, because he knows there's a moment when there'll be a really loud, laughter from the audience in this one line and that's the he's decided that's my moment and that happens around 10 15 he walks in because there's hidden by the laughter nobody hears anything shoots one time in the back of lincoln's head the young person he's not young the major hops up obviously he hears it he tries to get a booth booth has a knife he cuts the major like all the way down his arm the guy had stitches he, he like he get he has mental problems later in his life um, the women are, you know, kind of obviously shrieking. Initially, people aren't sure what's going on because the sound, the gun was kind of muffled with the laughter. But then people are like, wait, there's not a gunshot in this play. And so then he hops over the top of the rail, catches his foot in the draping, and when he lands, he breaks his leg. And then he yells something. So there I've got on the slide, you know, he, that he yells, six Semper Tyrannus, which is thus always the tyrants, which is the motto of Virginia and the South is avenged. I have both listed because you have different people saying he said different things. And probably more likely, we're not sure exactly what he said, but it's certainly romantic to have him say the, you know, South is avenged kind of statement. Lincoln is carried across the street. There's really not much anybody could have done. Had it happened today, it would probably could not have saved his life. Uh, it obviously, he'd had a, an easier time getting through the end of his life and maybe modern medicine could have saved him. Word spreads through, obviously, town. Other things begin to come around about the other attacks. Um, the vice president was not assaulted. 
Grant was on the train and Grant himself reported hearing somebody j jiggling the door, didn't know what was going on with that. Later, he got an anonymous note, which everybody believes is from Harold, um, David Harold there, who said, hey, I came to kill you, but the door was locked and you're lucky. Um, you know, you wonder about the veracity of that kind of story, but still, there was some report by some workers on the railroad car that they had stopped the man trying to enter Grant's car. And Powell does get into the Secretary uh, Seward's house and is able to attack the secretary, knifes him several times. He, he ends up knifing four or five other people in the process, including two of Seward's sons. Um, he, he's a terrible assassin. Nobody died. Um, they were wounded, but nobody died, including the secretary. Next morning, Lincoln passes away and really casts the pall not over the, the Reconstruction. Lincoln's death is one of the most devastating parts of Reconstruction which kind of falls apart as, as, you know, as we've talked about a few times. Booth is able to escape. Um, the other two guys kind of go on their own. Harold catches up to him. They're traced, they're followed. It takes a while, but by April 26th, they're down back by the Rappahannock River where several battles we talked about were fought. He's, he's surrounded. He won't come go, he said, I'm not coming out. So they basically go in and start to burn the barn out. But then one of the guys is with them troops trying to get him, shoots him. Um, Harold is captured. All three men will be put on trial and uh, executed by being hung. Surratt was where his mother's house was where they had all kind of met and stayed at different times. And so even though he was not there, as I told you, he had left, his mother's put on trial. It's a very famous trial that involved this woman who literally had nothing to do with it, but she also is found guilty and executed. Now, with this, you have this series of things that happens in April and May that is kind of the culmination, kind of wrapping up of the war. Anderson goes back to Fort Sumter, raises the flag that had been taken down, the same flag. Um, Johnson surrenders. Um, May 10th, Davis is captured down in Georgia. He'll be held in captivity in prison for two years. And then he's released on parole. Actually, the parole was paid for by even some abolitionists who, when they were asked, why did you do it? They were like, well, um, you know, he, he did, had not been given the speedy trial he was promised. And then later, Johnson will pardon him. Um, so he will not be tried and he'll be, you know, released of any charges. And then the last major army out in Texas will surrender May 26th. And that's it, right? That's the end. And, and so, so you kind of come then to this moment where you say, well, 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 what does it mean? And I don't know that we'll really all ever have a good grasp on what it means because history is a living thing. It's always kind of moving, right? But I'm going to show you some things that I thought of. And there's one question I want to answer as we get to it and we get to a spot where it'll fit really well um, to answer. Um, when the Civil War for now continues to be this dividing point, if the country continues to exist and we get another hundred years, it won't be obviously the middle. I don't know what historians will do then. But for now, it is this kind of this icon. There's kind of a before and there's an after. For various reasons, there's a before and there's an after. One is the struggle about between Locke and Hobbes, where we started, you know, talking earlier in our in our journey 13 weeks ago. It kind of diminishes. It diminishes because people don't realize this. Hobbes wins. Lincoln and the Republicans are able to win the war by doing the very thing the Confederates or the Southern states had left mad about, uh, an empowered federal government. It wasn't really empowered in 1860, and had they stayed in, it would not probably have become empowered because Lincoln had no plans to kind of do what they thought. But through the fighting of the war, we get a more empowered federal government, and it will stay that way um, all the way till Reagan. Reagan becomes the first president to really even challenge that, in my opinion, the idea that the federal government should not be stronger but weaker. And all of you were alive like I was when he was elected, so you know that. And there's this reaction in the last 30 years that we've had since Reagan has been all back into that Hobbes and Locke tension. The debate about power as far as secession, it was answered for at least the next 80 years because the idea is you can secede, a state can leave, that sort of settled until post-World War II and you get a new civil rights fight and you have a whole new Southern set of leaders rising up claiming um, states' rights. 
and nullification. And you get, and remember Dr. King talked about that in his very famous speech in the March on Washington, talking about the governor of Alabama, his lips dripping with the words of nullification. Well, that's all the way back to Jefferson and Jefferson's views on things. The USA as an idea shifts from being plural to singular. If you had ever done something as a country, you always would have used plural nouns. So like the USA are going to war. You know, that's what they would have said. Today, we would say if we're going to the Olympics, right? The USA is in the Olympics. We would use a singular. We think of the USA now as a singular noun. But that all happens right here at the Civil War. This idea of a national character will have deep ramifications or implications at this moment when the country over the next 50 years begins to really walk onto the national global stage. The idea of democracy will pick up more momentum. And as we will see in the coming weeks, the idea of aren't we a democracy becomes the default to where you get to after Woodrow Wilson, most Americans believe erroneously that we're a democracy. And they have very little understanding what the founders were actually setting up with their republic. And then as we've already said, slavery dies after 246 years. I mean, Lincoln, 250, fine, it sounded better. But technically, if you go back to 1619, 246 years, right? Maybe some of our tensions today is going to take us to the 2100s because it'll be 246 years after 1865. Maybe it takes that long to pay off the bondsman's blood debt that Lincoln talked about. Reconstruction will be a real choppy experience. There, there's a lot to go into. We're not, I already told you, we're not going to do Reconstruction um, in, in any real depth. We'll touch on it some uh, in the coming weeks. Um, the Republicans will fight with Johnson. Johnson will be extraordinarily stubborn and flexible, as other historians have said before me. He was probably the, one of the worst type of people to become president by accident. And if there was going to be any hope in the story, it would have needed to be. Um, Lincoln's flexibility. So, one, so a question came in on the chat about the 40 acres and a mule. What, did it stay after the war or was it taken back? Well, it was taken back under Johnson's leadership, primarily on something we can all understand, the idea of private property. So people would go to Johnson, it's like, hey, look, this is my property and I want it back. And he had, they all had to sign off like they pledged allegiance to the United States. And the moment they did that, made that oath of allegiance, Johnson's like, yep, sure, fine, all your property is back to you. So then in 1865, I mean, 66 and 67, you have these really tragic scenes of, of U.S. soldiers, many of which who were black, um, having to go to these towns and these places where, in some cases, there were only African-American freedmen who had formed their own societies and, and cities and done everything that Reverend Frazier had talked about doing and showed up and basically said, you don't get to have this land anymore. So it's really a tragedy in that process. And when Johnson was challenged with it, he just, he was in, incapable of being flexible with the Republicans um, in the process. The, the, res, the Reconstruction Amendments, they all change the relationship. They all do really good things. But what they do is they empower. If you look at the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights talks all about binding and limiting the government. You know, the First Amendment, the Congress shall make no law, blah, 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 right? Uh, at least for the first six or seven of the, of the Bill of Rights Amendments, first six amendments. Now, 13, 14, 15 empowers the federal government to do things to protect for citizens against the states, in essence. So that's a huge change. The 14th Amendment introduces the whole idea of civil rights, which has been a crucial aspect of our journey, national journey, since then. Reconstruction never achieves its goals in the time of Reconstruction. Um, political reunion and renewed importance, remember what I told you a moment ago about South Carolina, well, Jimmy Carter gets elected in 76, as you know, and then um, uh, Bill Clinton gets elected in 92, which you know. And so those are the first significant Southern uh, political moments, and the South becomes like this really important time between, say, 70, 1970, and 1990, still to this day to some degree, with the Sun Belt and people moving to the South. And that has a lot to do with the second goal of economic diversification. There's no diversification in the South. They stay locked in. Um, agriculture, 
You may remember before the war, the South by itself would have been the third or fourth richest nation in the world. They will not return to a level of similar wealth for the states of the South well into the 20th century, probably not to the 1990s. And that all happens with the coming of the Sun Belt. And then, of course, civil rights. Well, you know, we're still having this long, long debate. We haven't hit 246 years, so maybe that's a clue for us, you know, in the process. Um, in the South, because I, I blame Lincoln, um, his lenient plan connected with Johnson's stubborn and his overt racism. Um, and of course, you remember we saw last time in 1864, the Democrats will just openly run a racist campaign. They will do it again in 66. They'll do it in 68. In fact, they'll, they'll run very openly white man only um, campaigns well into the 20th century. There's a change for the Democrats, which is a 20th century history conversation. Um, Johnson will negotiate about the 13th Amendment with the states that hadn't signed off on it yet, and he will the uh, 14th Amendment, although he will be out of office by that point, but initially, and he basically says, you know, you can do what you want to, to the black people. They're just not slaves. For Johnson's mind, there was no place in America for African Americans. They wanted to stay. You're not a slave. Fair enough, but that's it. You have no other, like, rights or privileges beyond that moment. And so the states will take him at his word and they'll begin introducing things like black codes. If there were um, African-Americans who got out of, you know, out of line, white supremacy groups began to come up. At this point, the Klan is just one of many white supremacy groups. The, the Klan is not the Klan until you get to Woodrow Wilson in the 19, 1920s, basically. But there's a whole host of white supremacy groups. The Supreme Court, which of course was mostly Democrats because there'd only been the Democrat Party and the Whig Party before the war, um, fails to support Reconstruction, most damningly uh, with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, so at the very end of the 19th century. But all Plessy versus Ferguson does is reinforce, you know, what had already been done de facto, you know, on the ground, right, in the South, which was that there, they may not be slaves, but they're, but they're not going to be in a position where they can have general rights that will allow them. Even though the 14th Amendment does make them official citizens in an attempt to give them voting, and then of course the 15th Amendment specifies voting is included for a citizen. So the failure of, of Reconstruction and the failure of the Supreme Court to try to step in there and until uh, Dwight Eisenhower sends troops to Arkansas in 18, in 1956, for the Little Rock Nine, the federal government um, will abandon a focus on civil rights through that whole time period, um, both Republican and Democrat. And it'll be a Republican, Eisenhower, who will finally do what Lincoln did and Grant does, and that's to send troops in. Um, this concludes this, the, the Civil War age cycle. So I've told you before, we won't get lost here, but we talked about before, you know, that there's this 80-year pattern, 80-year-ish period of time, and it always ends with a great crisis, but then it always goes into the high, so like the springtime, we're all happy, we're all upbeat, everything's great. Well, of all the civil, of all the American cycles, and we're finishing number six now, so we're in the fourth turning, the crisis period for our current you know, season or cycle, um, this is the only one in which there isn't really an upbeat. There's no happy, right? And, and here's a picture of all the cycles. I've showed you this before. We don't really have time to, to go into it. I just wanted you to see it again, trying to make sure we get done. We're going to run a little long time, just a smidgen long. But that Civil War age, ends and the, what's called the, the next one's called the great power cycle it doesn't start very happy instead it's subdued there's so much death i mean there's you know 600 700,000 people wounded or killed i should say and then many more wounded um in the south is devastated economically in many cities and regions in the south 20 30 even 40 percent of men of, of military age never come back of course ptsd is not known at the time but it's devastating the North kind of rocking along and things are good, but then Reconstruction gets really messy. And so that makes it really tough. And you see some changes in the country, not the kind of high, we're all together, we survived this crisis, but really kind of an, an embittered kind of feeling. Um, civic engagement goes away and all the focus will turn to business, industrialism, capitalism. 
Um, in a large percentage at this point, probably 70% of Americans live on farms. By 1900, it'll be down to like 25%. And as you move to the 20th century, it'll be, it'll be well down. It'll go down to the single digits percentile wise. Um, and you go from, you know, some, remember the, the American dream is not to be rich. The American dream is to have my own land so that I can live independently, you know, not under a feudal lord. Well, that all gets flipped around because of getting a job and working for a job. And then perhaps most damning, corruption becomes rampant. You know, so you wanted the Civil War to, to mean something more glorious. And it does have some more glorious things. For all the negatives that we think of for Reconstruction, and I, I will say I think it's a big negative. It was a failure, is a way to put it. It's a lost opportunity. There were positives that come out of it. There was African Americans voting. America goes from being one of the last countries to have slavery and end slavery to the very first country to try to create an inter interracial, multiracial society. Um, for all the other countries that had, you know, not had slavery, there still was a very deep division between the ethnic majority uh, who had, you know, could say we started the country, right? the German people, the French people, the English people. And here we just went headlong into it. And, and it's been bumpy. It's been bumpy. It was bumpy then and maybe it's still bumpy now. But at the same time, we started trying to do something then and really had before been trying to do something that I think echoes Lincoln's ethos, which is that we were trying to create a society that was multicultural, that was equal rights, that was open to all. And we're really... I know this frustrates some people. We're the only country on the planet even still really trying to do that. If you look at modern UN records of race and ethnicity in countries, most countries are at 80, if not 90% of one certain ethnicity, and then there'll be one minority group. And we're like 68%. It's still a heavy percentage of um, Anglo-European, but there's still a multiplicity of people. And even in the midst of what 2020 has been chaotic, and you think of the last four or eight years or 12 years, everybody still moves here. Everybody still wants to come here. And the, the freedmen saw positive. They got to vote. They elected officials from local all the way to senators of states. Um, there were African Americans who were senators and representatives and lieutenant governors and sheriffs and mayors. They had economic opportunity. Sharecropping, which my grandparents did in the 1920s, sharecropping, which has a negative connotation and there, it ends up being a really bad, and as some people have said, it's slavery without the chains, it still allowed for some freedoms. Um, African Americans were no longer being told when they had to work, what they had to plant, how they had to plant it. That allowed them some independence. Again, it, it kind of we, we'd say generally it goes sour as we go along through the 19th century. At least I would say that. But comparatively, it's a big positive. And out of this kind of depressed or maybe embittered sense of you know what happened, there still was this momentum that took off for social change. In other words, you can almost hear the, the words of Lincoln echoing through the rest of the 19th century, and people begin thinking, yeah, we need to do that. And I think I would remind people when they, when they worry or think about the country, at least we're having, maybe we're yelling at each other and we're having a debate, but we're at least not afraid to say, this is the situation, and maybe it's not as good as it could be. And in the latter 19th century, in all those areas, there's civil rights, voting rights, employee worker rights, urban renewal, education reforms. There's going to be a whole host of men and women who are going to step forward, white and black, Hispanic, some Native Americans, who are going to step forward and say, hey, we, we can improve, we can make it better, and we're going to try to work to make it better. And that, I think, is a positive when you think about the Civil War. And that brings us to the end. Um, we've had a journey, 13 sessions. I don't know if we'll do another long session, 13 sessions like this. And when we get back to, to uh, whatever, our, whatever it looks like, I wouldn't say back to normal. I'm trying not to say that anymore. Um, but the, the journey of the country led from the previous crisis of the revolution to this crisis. And it left a scar. And I think it's a scar we still bear but sometimes scars are good, right? They kind of remind you that, you know, that you've been living 
They remind you that you did some things, that you participated in some things, and maybe scars tell you you had a mistake and you maybe made an error, but I think also there's, there's a sense in which a scar can be a reminder of, of a time when you tried something, a time when you, you, know, you made an effort. And in our case, our journey through the Civil War um, and the whole journey to, from the beginning to why we had a war and then into this war, eliminating slavery and the victory of the Union, um, it's a wonderful story. It's not one to be ashamed of. It's a positive story, story, even though it's got parts that maybe are frustrating and make us sad. And I have loved, as always, being with you guys. Thanks tonight for letting us go a little longer. Again, if you have any questions, please drop them uh, in, the, in the email to me or tell Becca to, to send it to me. I'd love to answer it. Again, for if you didn't hear, we're not going to meet next week, and we'll pick back up again in two weeks when we'll start our look at our uh, social and cultural uh, changes in the latter 19th century. Thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure to be with you through this series. Hope you have a good night. Bye-bye.